guys welcome back to my youtube channel so if you are new here please subscribe to my youtube channel so today i'm reacting to charlie cake best moment of the week wow i love reacting to charlie's video like this is lovely so guys please stay tuned let's continue i would just like to know you know you being a husband a father and a big political figure it's like how do you cope with like making all of those things important in your life. You mention a lot, which is, I'm a big fan of Aristotle. Aristotle talked about a hierarchy of the good. Uh, when you have a lot going on, this is a good rule for young people, you gotta make a hierarchy of what matters most, and you gotta prioritize that thing over other things, which means, by definition, other things are gonna slip aside. Um, and realize it's not all about you. And this is one of the great, I, I just, I hate the self-love movement, I, help, I hate the self-esteem movement, it's done so much damage, I think it's one of the great you know, um, philosophical carcinogens in our society in so many different ways. I saw this sign the other day. They said, it's your imperfections that make you perfect. And I, I, I thought to myself, I said, well then therefore by definition, the more imperfections you have, the better you are. What kind, or, or my favorite one is, the world is better because you're in it. Now, that might sound like a good message, but in reality, it should be a question. Is the world better because you're in it? <laughs> right? It should, and so, it should be a question. It has the world become a better place because of you? Now, so the idea of a hierarchy of what matters most is not taught a lot to our kids. There's a big lie out there that you could have it all, and that's not true. You can't. You have to make sacrifices. Uh, you could still do a lot. You could still run a business, and you could still do things, but you have to make time for what matters most. One of the reasons why we have such a depressed generation suicidal generation, um, we have such an anxious generation, a medicated generation, is they're thinking about themselves all the time. I, I believe a people that is not dedicated to service is a very depressed people. It's not always about you. Sometimes you have to do stuff you don't like because it's going to benefit somebody else. By the way, we just know that scientifically you're a happier person because of that. We know that, regardless of the spiritual implications or the moral implications. And so we have an entire generation that's always asking, like, how do you feel? How do you feel about that? It's actually quite irrelevant. It more, matters more about what you're doing. And here's a, here's a thought-provoking thing for you. Generally, what you do should dictate how you feel, not how you feel with what you do. That's a good general rule to tell a young person. Another good rule for life, which is self-control is a lot more important than self-esteem. But we do the opposite. Thank you. I want to ask how do you believe we can further prevent the government from infringing upon our Second Amendment rights? So everything in life is a choice and a trade-off. Anybody who tells you differently is an infant. And so you have, to, you have to prioritize things that matter more than others. This is why I love Aristotle. He talks constantly about hierarchies, right? He talks about the, the hierarchy of the good, the hierarchy of choices, the hierarchy of behavior, the hierarchy of character. And so when it comes to firearms or guns, we must first ask the question of why. Why do we have a Second Amendment? It is not for hunting, but I do love hunting. Do we love hunting out here, everybody? Hunting is very important. It is not even for self-defense, but that's very important. Defending your home, defending your family is a moral good. The unpopular to say, but morally correct reason we have a Second Amendment is so that free people can defend their rights in case government becomes tyrannical. I fully acknowledge that comes with a cost. The cost is this. If you make that argument that people should be able to own firearms against a usurptatious potential tyrannical government, you're going to have negative externalities. You're going to have gang shootings. You're going to have mass shootings. The question is how do we minimize it? And the question is how do we reduce it to almost zero? And we have never had that proper conversation. For example, if banks and sporting events have armed guards, every school in America should have armed guards sitting 24-7 at the school. Period. End of story. If airports have armed guards, schools should have armed guards. And so you must come after it morally clear. I will never say that we'll get gun deaths to zero because we live in a broken world and we live in a place where there's a lot of nut jobs and a lot of evil people. But the choice that I'm unwilling to make, I am not willing to say we get rid of all of guns. Why? Because even more evil than an isolated incident there and an isolated shooting there is a tyrannical government that wants to exterminate its citizens. And so that is the way we must talk about guns. Reduce and minimize the criminality and the shootings through prudent and proper restrictions, which most of the times mean 
good people with a firearm to protect against a bad person with a firearm. If education to fire the bad teachers, what's your definition of bad teachers? Great question. So how many people here think you've had at least one teacher that deserves to be fired? Everyone raise their hand always. Always. Um, so the question is, how do you find them, right? Best metric is you have teachers, grade teachers, and you have parental input. Here's the thing. You know the really, really bad teachers. The, those have got to go. I had teachers earning $150,000 a year, barely showing up for class, teaching gym, doing nothing, being completely lazy. They're a drain on the school budget. They're a drain on the local community, and they should be fired instantaneously. The problem is, under current teacher tenure laws in certain states, in most states, they are protected by by contracts designed by teacher unions that make it nearly impossible to fire bad teachers. What about professors? Okay. Professors currently have a system that rewards professors that want to write their book and sell it back to their class. Um, <laughs> most college freshmen are taught by TAs, teacher's assistants, so they're, they're getting something, they're paying for something they're not even getting. Um, it's, it, I think measuring value in a professor should be different than that of a teacher, but here's the big difference is that, that public school teachers in K through 12 education um, have to be held to a different standard than professors. It just has to be. It's a different, there's more K through 12 teachers than there are professors, a lot more, almost 10 to one ratio. The whole point on the TAs, they're usually doctoral students. Yes. That are turning into professors. So why is that a problem? How are, how are the TAs supposed to Because be when you start to have class sizes that are 500 people and plus, when you have TAs that are not yet masters on the subject that you're paying a pretty penny on, that deserves question. Because you are going to college to learn from subject matter experts in an environment where you can dive deep into that particular topic, so on and so forth. So if I'm paying or I'm being forced to pay $800 for this sociology class or you know, human studies class or North, you know, and I'm getting taught by a TA with 800 people in a lecture hall this big, that, that could, that there's something I think wrong with that. No, I actually think Elon Musk is very interesting where he just doesn't care what people say about him. He is a visionary and a pioneer and it gets to this question of why is America becoming less free? Things end up being in hierarchies, okay, in sports, in music, in class, some people work hard, some people have different gifts, it's life, it's not fair, but it's the way it is, okay? So things naturally develop in hierarchies. So the question should not be whether or not we have hierarchies, the question should be what do the people do once they're on the top of the hierarchy, okay? Our elites are in tandem to try to crush all of you. They're working in har harmoniously to do it, to suppress your speech, to deteriorate your currency, to keep the border wide open, like you're the worst thing in the world. And the, really we need a restoration of an American elite population that hopefully looks at the money that they've earned or the money they've received if they inherited it, not as some sort of massive repatriation campaign to go fund global warming type stuff, but instead, how can I preserve and protect the American project? And honestly, that's what Elon Musk is doing here. It's unprecedented. It's, it is unexpected. Let's pretend that disinformation was actually a huge problem. Okay, I don't think it is. Let's pretend it is. The answer is more speech. Have more people be able to then comment on it and have more people be able to make their own decisions. I trust the American people to make informed decisions a lot more than some fact checker at the New York Times that has the ability to shut up a Twitter account that they don't like. What's, what's also important is they say, well, Twitter shouldn't be a place of bullying. Okay, look, I don't like bullying. You shouldn't either. But when you have speech, you have to accept that there are going to be externalities that you might not like. That's called life, okay? If you cannot shut up certain ideas or perspectives, I don't know how much longer these people will hold on to power. I really don't. Because so many of the mass movements in our country the last couple of years have been built on extraordinary lies. Not little lies, but extraordinary lies. That America is somehow systemically racist. Are you kidding me? We're the least racist country ever to exist in the history of the world. Um, nothing, nothing irritates me more in modern American culture than the glorification of victimhood. Um, there is nothing admirable or virtuous about being a victim. In fact, it should be the exact opposite. Um, life is suffering, even if you have a bunch of money or you have no money, if you were born in a horrible economic condition, no matter what, you are going to go through some form of adversity and some form of suffering. Um, stop being a victim, okay? There's nothing worse than that because no one cares about how you feel. I, I can't wait 
One day, one day, these, these spoiled brat protesters that on a lot of these campuses go to the dean's office one day, just one day, and they go say all the things that they're offended about. They go all the things, you know, they play the victim card even though they go to like Tufts, which can be a break. I mean, like, you know, for example, you're an African-American student at Tufts, you're really that oppressed? Like, go make something of your life. Stop protesting these fictitious social justice causes. I can't wait for one of these presidents to just say, deal with it. Just deal with it. It's not my problem. You, the individual, go deal with that problem. Stop trying to play this blanket victim card just because of some BS identity group narrative that some leftist professor that's very unhappy in their own life tried to sell to you. Fix yourself. Then the world will start, will start becoming a better place. Stop trying to get other people to curtail their own livelihood, to curtail their freedom for your virtue signaling of what you consider to try to be a better world. Um, and so there's nothing that really frustrates me more than victimhood. Um, and I think a byproduct of everyone becoming a victim also is a, is a license to try to grow government, to try to penalize success, and try to go after America, to try to go after capitalism. Because when you have a culture of victims, all of a sudden it's really, really easy to sell socialism. My parents got divorced um, when I was a toddler. I have no memory of them together. Um, I'm 21 years old right now, and I got married this past Congratulations. April. Congratulations. Thank That's you. That's phenomenal. Um, That's thrilling. So I've never had a good role model in terms of you know marriage with my parents. So I was wondering, what would your best advice be for having a long, happy marriage? Oh, look, I mean, it's not about you. That's the most important thing that you'll learn really quick. It's about service. It's about you know commitment to the other. And this is the, this is the thing I always laugh about you know, when people say men and women are the same. When you're married for like an afternoon, you realize men and women are very much not the same, right? And so, I mean, a, a great example is, you know, when a, a man comes home from work, there could have been a nuclear explosion at work. How was work? It was fine. It was good. Where, where the wife just will talk about every single detail. That, it's just our na the nature, right? It's completely different. Um, and then, you know, Dennis Prager has a really great speech on this that drives the left crazy, um, which is that men... Men's nature is towards variety, okay? And I think it's very important for wives to just say to their husbands, thank you for being loyal to me. It's a very important thing. Um, a lot of men don't hear that enough. And it drives some women like, I don't want to have to say that. It's like, well, just study a little bit about men's nature and understand how men are kind of programmed towards variety. It's a very important thing. Um, the final thing is just carve time for one another. And so I turn my phone off every Friday night, turn it back on Sunday morning. I'm unreachable, unreachable by the world. And... You can just, you just have to focus on another person. The last thing I'll say is this, is social media and phones will do everything it possibly can to get in the way of your marriage. So do what you can to put those aside, silence them, and um, I wish you a very, very long and happy marriage, and hopefully children sometime soon. And I fully support young people getting married early. I think that's a very important thing. Now, the reason, and people say, well, it's a risk. Why can't I wait till I'm 28 or 30? You know, because what if it's the not the right? Everything in life is a risk. Okay, everything has a risk. But there's also another risk that you have to acknowledge, which is the risk of our thousands of listeners that email me and they say, I'm 35 and I haven't found anybody and it's too late. That's a risk too. And I can tell you right now, the risk of having despondency or having just kind of regret, that's the better word, that's a risk that some people need to know just as much as the risk of you might not be able to go to Paris every summer. the way um, Clark, I love the way he he speak always. I love his confidence. I love his um, how his vision, like how he sees the world. Like I'm so um, amazed. I'm s w this is this video sometimes where he where Clark when Clark teach, he teach with so much um, knowledge. Like even when you maybe you want to ask him some questions like you'll be shocked the way he will he will reply you you understand like when he said about marriage is good to marry young wow i was i was i was shocked when he and he gave a good reason for that and he always say have confidence on your in yourself you understand no matter maybe you are going to school your lecturer if if you pay for any ac academic um session or any any uh, um, study you pay for it and they're not teaching you what you want to learn or they're not teaching you where, you have to report, you have to say your mind, not just 
pretend as if you are okay, but you know you are not okay about the whole uh, um, story. And I love the way he, he, he don't just, um, Clark don't just talk about just one topic. He talk about general politics, marriage, student, bullying, talks about so much more. Like, I, I don't know how he got his strength, his ability to, to talk, his ability to say his mind, ability to touch one another, like, make you feel that, ah, like, talk about the bad part about what is going on in society not just you just want to say so you feel good no he just said the right thing at the right time like i'm so proud and i'm one of his fans clark i i'm one of your big fans i just if if um people can help me tag him on this video i really really appreciate i'm his big fan like i love i love every bit about him everything about him so guys please comment below in our comment section like this video subscribe to our youtube channel and get fashion store Fashion makes sense.